and welcome to the Sports Talk Line YouTube channel here on the Sports Talk Line Network where we talk sports 24-7, 365. I'm your host, Stephen Van, over here for the NFC East Weekly. This is week three we're talking about. I'm going to be covering both the Eagles and the Washington football team, no-name football team. And then we have Mr. Tom McAllister coming to you from New York City. How you doing, Tom? Good evening, sir. Thanks for having me, Van. Hopefully it's lovely out in California. All right. Pleasure it is. It is out here in Long Beach. And now also out here on the coast with me is the man with no remorse, Nate Doughty. And Nate, you have to tell us about something that hasn't happened in the National Football League ever. And we're going to be covering that last. It's about the Dallas Cowboys actually winning a game. I'm sorry for your misfortune, Van, about having to cover the other two teams in the division. <sighs> Well, I lost that bet. You know, I still swear it was a two-sided coin you used. I want to talk to you about that later. But let's jump right in now and talk about the Rams-Eagles game, and specifically the Eagles and what, they, what happened and where they are. And there's a lot to take from the game. And basically, the Eagles' D is highly susceptible to misdirection plays. They gave up the first touchdown on an end around uh, some nice ball handling, and it was wide open. It wasn't even close. They take themselves out of a lot of play with their aggressiveness, which is just something to keep in mind because if this team is doing it, other teams are going to be doing it. <clears throat> now, when you flip over to the Eagles' side of the ball, once you become predictable in the pocket, your pocket stays in one place, you're dropping back, you do that a couple of times in a row, they are going to get to you, and they're going to get to you in a hurry. You have to keep moving that pocket around. you got to keep changing the depth, do some rollouts, things like that, some screens help. As long as you keep changing it up, you can keep this Eagles defense in check, the pass rush at least. And that the moment that you lit off of it, they are on you. So pay attention. Do not get lazy with where you put that pocket. Conversely, if you let Wentz get comfortable in the pocket, he will chew you up. All right, if he's sitting back there and nobody's around him and he can look around, he will work through his progressions. He will make the right decision most of the time. And that's the other thing I wanted to talk about with him. He is in love with his arm a la Brett Favre. He will talk himself into making some throws, which he did in the third quarter, worked, excuse me, in the fourth quarter, worked their way all the way down the field, really nice drive, and then he rolls out no pressure whatsoever and decides to throw into double coverage in the end zone. Obviously, he thought he could get that ball in there, and it was a frozen rope. And the defender said, thank you very much. I, you know, I, I can handle that. And they lost it in the end zone. They lost the game going away, but it's plays like that from Wentz that I kind of compare him to uh, what the Giants have with Saquon Barkley and that he hurts them as much as he helps them somewhat. Um, so now also I hate to admit it with the Rams, okay, Goff is getting better. And so the Philadelphia defense, they definitely had some problems with him because you can get at their DBs. If you have some time in the pocket, you can go after their DBs. Their linebacking core is pretty good, but their DBs, they are susceptible. But it was a brutal fourth quarter for the Eagles. I mean, just brutal. They settled for a field goal on a promising drive, gave up a touchdown, turned the ball over on downs, gave up another touchdown, and then threw an interception to end the game. That's not winning football. And so I just don't think that that's going to bode well for them. I think they got a lot of ground to make up. Nate, what do you think? Uh, just to go back to your point, it's interesting because we watched the Rams the week before. They run about three or four different plays. They run the wide zone, they run the wide zone play action fake, and then they run the wide zone uh, bootleg. That's essentially the three plays they like to run, but they miss in Mac formations, but they have you scrambling all over the place with their motion. And if you know Jim, uh, Mike Zimmer, actually not Mike Zimmer, Jim uh the defensive coordinator to the Philadelphia Eagles is a Buddy Ryan disciple. Correct. He's from that school where he learned it from Jeff Fisher. So they're easily one of the more aggressive defenses in the league. And so they definitely took advantage of that. Another thing with Carson Wentz, he gave up eight sacks the week before, but seven of those eight sacks were plays where he held onto the ball for four seconds or more. Right. So this week he looked very timid when it came in it, it came to the game plan where they were definitely not taking shots down the field. They were more predictable. 
They didn't have anybody out there who could really stretch the field for them. They run a lot of 12 personnel, which means they have two tight ends on the field. That's where they're not really stressing any kind of defenses. And he seems to have lost a lot of his confidence uh, on plays where he felt like his clock was running out. He seemed to where previously he would have tried to make a play himself. He just seemed to have given up and to throw it away. Um, and even then, he still made mistakes. He's hurting this football team more than he's helping them. Well, I'll just, you know, fill in for Spinksy. He couldn't be here today. They kept the wrong quarterback. They kept the wrong quarterback. That's all I'm going to say. Okay, I, I think I covered that fairly well. Okay. Uh, Tom, what do you think? You know, is there anything? It's really no news that the Eagles need some wide receivers. Okay. Um, yeah, it, it seems like the Eagles really didn't address, you know, they had secondary issues last year. They also have wide receiver issues. And it just seems like with Carson Wentz, they already signed him to that contract extension, and it's going to be uh, – he's still going to be getting paid, you know, that, since that ACL injury, you know, he kind of hasn't been the same player. And the Eagles really haven't been the same franchise since they won the Super Bowl. I can understand a Super Bowl hangover for one, for one year, but the Eagles have underachieved the last few years. And, and it's they're going to start pointing fingers, and a lot of the fingers are going to be pointing at uh, Carson Wentz. Exactly. Hey, you got anything to add on? Yeah, I'm just going to add, I just want to add this. And I want the people on YouTube to answer this question. Is Carson Wentz a poor man's Derek Carr? Ooh, all right. Leave a comment below, all right? Please hit that subscribe button. Please hit that notify bell. Without you, folks, this show doesn't happen. Thank you so very much. And also, we want to know what you think about that. Is he? All right, and now let's segue right back into the Giants, man. That's enough about the Eagles, which I might say right now, I think is the number four team in the NFC East, hands down. All right, um, but Tom, what do you think about that comment? You know, Carson Wentz, Saquon Barkley, are they both like good, bad news for their teams? Well, I, I think the one critique on Saquon Barkley right now is he's injury prone. Um, the reason why is the first play of the second quarter against the Chicago Bears – uh, Saquon Barkley went out with a knee injury, and that knee injury turns out to be a torn ACL. So his 2020 is finished. Um, the really sad part is Saquon Barkley played a quarter, and he was the Giants' leading rusher for the entire game. Ooh. So that is kind of something that doesn't make you feel warm and fuzzy going forward. You know, um, when you look at the units, um, be because Giant fans were coming into 2020, and they know they're in a rebuild mode. Um, they weren't going to be some of these teams like, oh, hey, you know, you know, we're going to make a Super Bowl run. I think realistically most Giant fans were just looking for improvement because so many times in 2019 they were overmatched. Um, so a unit-by-unit unit improvement. A lot. First off, let's talk about the secondary. A lot of people thought that, that this would be a weakness of the Giants coming into 2020. But in the first two games, they haven't appeared to be a tremendous weakness. Um, James Bradbury was the top-rated cornerback um, – from pro football focus in week two. Uh, he made a great interception and he shut down Allen Robinson where Robinson was targeted nine times when he only made three catches. Um, they really haven't exploited anyone else in the secondary um, to say the least. At the linebacker level, you have Lorenzo Carter, who's a third, this is his third year in the NFL. looks like he's starting to develop into an edge rusher. He had a sack in week one. He had a sack in week two. Um, Blake Martinez, who came over in free agency, seems to be a tackling machine, which is something the Giants haven't had in a long time. Right. Up front, I felt was always a strength. They have Dalvin Tomlinson, um, Dexter Lawrence, and uh, Leonard Williams. Uh, this this week, B.J. Hill came in um, and had a sack off the bench as a defensive tackle. So those are kind of some things you see the improvement in. I think the Giants are number four in the NFL in total defense. It's just offensively they got tremendous weaknesses where they're dead last in the rush game. With Saquon Barkley going out, that doesn't help. And that leaves Daniel Jones in one dimensional. So it was the tale of two halves. The Giants were down 17 0. This is the second week in a row that the New York Giants let the opposition come down at the end of the first half and give up a touchdown. All right. Take away though, take away that play. You know, if they settle for field goals on both, the Giants could have a different season. Um, also offensively, the second half, it looked like the offensive line is starting to find their way a little bit because you got to remember they pretty much are, have three new starters. Um, they have Cam Fleming at right tackle, Nick Gates at center, and Andrew Thomas at left tackle. Andrew Thomas looks to be legit going forward. You know, and you finally saw the Giants create some push 
Um, they actually scored on a fourth and goal in a goal line formation, which was surprising to say the least. But what the Giants need, you know, Daniel Jones, he had his opportunity um, to lead the Giants down to get the game-winning score. Chicago gave him an, an opportunity. You know, Chicago was up 17 nothing. The Giants' defense came back. They got stops for the rest of the second half. There was a missed field goal. Unfortunately, Golden Tate got called for that offensive pass interference. This was something where if Daniel Jones was able to convert that touchdown, this changes the Giants' season around all of a sudden. You know, all of a sudden they're tied for first place uh, in the NFC East, and it's wide open going forward. Um, so it looks like defensively they've overachieved so far in 2020. Offensively, they've underachieved. Now, Van, you got something to add on? Well, yeah. You know, you mentioned Williams in the middle, and he's a real enigma. I mean, exactly how is that going to turn out? There's no doubting that he had the talent coming out. It never really truly blossomed, but he still flashes. And maybe he's not what people had hoped he would be, but he's definitely a difference maker in the middle. But uh, Gettleman got rid of Snacks Harrison, right? <clears throat> uh, traded him away. This is his replacement. Gave up some stuff to get him. And then now he may be gone next year. Or if he does stay, he's going to cost some money. But now he's definitely playing very well this year, isn't he? So far, he's definitely improved in 2020 over his 2019. It's just when you look at the Giants defensively, that is their strongest position defensively is defensive line. You know, because you, you can see if you're looking at contracts, you know, I believe if Leonard Williams does not sign with the New York Giants, they'll have a give up a fifth round pick instead of a fourth round pick. Um, I, I have to check on that. So this is something, too, if you're Dave Gettleman and you're still in charge, which is a big if uh, going into 2021, you could have the philosophy of like, you know what, let's have Leonard Williams walk and let's B.J. Hill get this opportunity because I like their defensive line. You, you know, they're starting to create – a pass rush now in two consecutive weeks where, you know, quarterbacks aren't just able to hold the ball for four or five, six seconds and pick apart the secondary. Yeah. I just want to, I just want to voice my displeasure with the both of you at this very moment, just for the sole reason I had to do this show and I had to watch this game. Oh my God. What a snooze fest this game was. Um, with that being said, going on top of Tom's point, the defense has overachieved. If you look at both touchdowns the Bears scored, they were both on broken plays where Mitchell Trubisky was able to escape and create plays on his own. Uh, conversely, Daniel Jones, at least in the first half, seems to still hold onto the ball too long, seems indecisive at times, uh, and red zone offense is another key point where they're going to struggle. Uh, if you look back to Jason Garrett's days with the Cowboys, uh, anytime they were able to develop any kind of a red zone efficiency was because of uh, Des Bryant and the fade passes they were throwing to him. When that went away, they were unable to consistently get any kind of a red zone kind of a push. Um, that's going to be something that's going to be cause for concern, but especially without Saquon Barkley going forward. However, I did not see the New York Giants, New Jersey Giants, excuse me, be they're killers on defense and i mean that more ways than one because their field's so shitty they tear up everyone else's knees in the league strategy well that they share it with the jets okay yeah so so that that's why but that that you all nate you do bring up a good point in the red zone efficiency and this is a second week in a row where the giants went one for three um scoring a touchdown in the red zone and that's something in the nfl that separates the six and 10 teams from the 10 and six teams. Van, what do you got? Well, yeah. And with the Saquon Barkley injury, I think the biggest immediate victim of that uh, was Slayton. Because you think that now they're going to focus on Slayton going forward? Well, I, I, I think they did. I, I think they played Slayton very well that game. And, and I, you know, when you look at it at, as to what happened, once Saquon went out, the defense changed. The whole game plan changed insofar as what the defense was looking for and what they were respecting. Yeah, you know, I, I totally I agree, too. And, you know, you put any quarterback in a one-dimensional offense, they're probably going to struggle. Um, and when there's absolutely no threat of a running game, it doesn't help out the quarterback. I mean, Daniel Jones still makes some throws that, you know, are sometimes questionable. Um the, the first quarter was just absolutely atrocious on both sides of the ball for the Giants. Um, they came out. Um, Chicago had a seven-plus-minute drive for a touchdown. 
Um, then I think their first possession, the Giants, you know, Daniel Jones has a fumble recovery. Then they go three and out. Um, it, it was just bad. Um, they start getting momentum. Daniel Jones throws. Uh, Evan Ingram falls down, throws it to the Bears defender. It, it's not It's not what you wanted. They did flip the script enough, but this is going to challenge Jason Garrett without Saquon Barkley for the entire year where, you know, how are they going to be going forward? Van, what do you got? Well, I was just going to tell you, you know, Cowboys fans went through this last season about the heartbreaker and the injuries and everything coming down. But trust me, it could be worse. At least Jason Garrett is at your – oh, never mind. Joe Judges. <laughs> I would say this, though, but but the last thing I'll say about the Giants, it does look like there's a culture change. You know, yes. we're not going They're out. playing hard, man. I think yeah. the defense has improved. I think the offensive line has improved, but hey, yes. man, they're missing some talent with the opt out, et cetera. I mean, it's no excuses. Everybody yeah. else in the league is dealing with it. That the Dallas Cowboys were decimated with injuries, mm -hmm. and they somehow pulled out a victory. So there are no yeah. excuses in the NFL. All right, yeah. but oh. let's move on to another team here that that doesn't have any excuses, and I'm talking about the Washington team with no name. Um, I still love their defensive line. Going to jump right to it. I, I think that they were really great, but they definitely had an issue with it. What, what jumped out to me right away in this game uh, with the Arizona Cardinals is how can you leave Hopkins all alone in the end zone? I just don't get that. I don't care what defense you're playing. I don't care if you're a rookie. I don't care if you're a 50-year veteran. Are you going to look around and go, hmm, that's a good idea to just leave him alone? I mean, fuck, you know, we, we don't need to cover that guy. So, and of course, it had the desired result. Um, running back Antonio Gibson, all right? I, I realized that they cut Peterson, and um, it, it was a mistake. I mean, he's a good ball player. He, he, he's like a good egg, you know, that's what Grandpa would say. But, of course, the hen's ass is full of him. Uh, he's a nice all-around player. I'm not seeing anything special from him. AP could move the pile still. This guy fights hard. I'll give you that. And it's not that I don't like him. It's just that I don't see that as exceptional something. Maybe he shows it in practice. Landon Collins is fitting in very nicely. He's making some splash, some splash plays. Uh, all the way through the game, he was in position. He got the early turnover. Really nice. Bostic is the wild card in the pressure of the defensive front for that uh, for, for for Washington. When he when they send him, he usually gets there. He is a mean machine. He's a total wild card. They don't know when he's coming, and when he does, he's coming through a gap because everybody else is occupied with the guys on that front line, and that that's the thing right there. The guys on the front line, they ran into a really good game plan with the Cardinals. The Cardinals knew that they were going to have to get rid of that ball in a hurry, so they immediately had a lot of really quick short routes. They took the pocket, and of course they had Murray at quarterback, and his explosiveness when he decides to, be, to go from standing there to I'm leaving is like boom, a blink of an eye, and he's gone. Yeah, Tom. Is this more of an indictment on how good the Arizona Cardinals are going forward with Kyle Murray and DeAndre Hopkins than how the Washington football team is? Yeah, I you said, know, go ahead. I said last week, I think when we fast forward another 10 weeks, the Philadelphia Eagles lost to the Redskins are going to come down and look like they lost to one of the worst teams in the league. Well, and it's I, not the case at all, though. It's not the I case at all. The, the, the first, the first uh, uh, half was mainly, uh, you know, what, what, was all Cardinals, okay? They had it. They should have gone, had it going away. They almost did what Atlanta did, but they did not because – Washington put their head down and came back and made made some good, good football happen in the second half. In the second half, I saw the <laughs> offense come out. Hopkins uh, was actually making some good decisions. I saw sacks on the QB. I saw them stopping the run. I saw turnovers. I saw them getting there with pressure. They never gave up. It was nice. But in the end, in the fourth quarter, <clears throat> boom, it all came apart, and they gave up another touchdown there. Uh, they've still got a long way to go. But I tell you what, there's a lot to like with this team, a lot to like. But they've got holes, and you can attack those holes. And the QB, he's got talent, okay? He can play, but, 
you know, it, is he at Murray's level? No, he's not even close, okay? And it probably won't be. Murray's a special, special guy. The Cardinals know it. I think they can go as far as their defense will take them. Yeah, well, going back to uh, going back to Washington, the football team, I still can't believe that's their name. Uh, Haskins really, really is many years away from even making any kind of a, a contribution really to the team. Uh, and it, it's a week of contrast. Last week, they had two injuries on the, the right side of the offensive line with the Philadelphia Eagles. They didn't have that excuse this week. And also, you take a different dynamic athlete, as you were saying, Dan, and Kyler Murray. It's like Ricky Henderson at quarterback. You well, know? they had a good game plan. They they moved the pocket constantly. They rolled him out, uh, or he was throwing a slant. Okay, a play action is when he would probably go down the field. Uh, he was not just dropping back saying, come give me. He was constantly moving around. And then when he had to just buy time on his own, it was like, I'm here. And like, it's like the cartoon where it just leaves and there's a puff of smoke. You know, well, Where'd he go? You know, he, he is gone. He is really dynamic to watch. He is the best. That, that was in my game notes. He is the best uh, runner on that uh, football team, on the Cardinals. It's not even close. He is that dynamic. But conversely, on the other side, Chase Young, he's going to get his in the running game. He's going to get his in the passing game. And he's going to do it every game. This guy is going to be dominating. Uh, he, he, he was just impressive. But Washington has too many holes. They're going to have to really play superior football and or be lucky enough to run into, like, I don't know, the Eagles again. Right. I mean, then that's the <laughs> – and that's going to be the, the tale. I mean, weeks from now, uh, I, I still look at the – if we're evaluating the division so far, I still feel like Philadelphia is the better team. Even oh, I don't. I, I do not. I, I think Philadelphia could be the better team. But right now, they are so dysfunctional the way that they're playing. They obviously are not the better team. And I think Washington has more fight uh, than, than the Eagles. And I think they've displayed it. Two games in a row, they never gave up against the Cardinals. We're coming back strong. And as you well know, I believe you're getting ready to tell us, fight is important if you want to win. Well, I'm going to staple on uh, a Jason Garrett quote, finish the fight, which is something he started off in Dallas. And, ooh, we, man, we had ourselves a game. We're talking five turnovers to nothing. And, yes, I said five turnovers. Yes, they're only counting three of them. But if you, which you have to include the both times they fake punts and missed. That's five turnovers right there yep. to none. And the analytics, it was the ghost of Kyle Shanahan. He did it once in Atlanta. He did it last year in San Francisco. But did he leave Atlanta? No, no, really. no, 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 no. It was a 99.9% .9 chance the Falcons were supposed to win this game, Tom. I know you're excited. I can tell by the big grin on your face. You're loving every second of this. But getting back to the actual points that you want to lay down, Dak Prescott is a franchise quarterback. There's no more discussion. He proved it last game. He has the most comebacks of any quarterback since he was drafted in this league with 15. Okay? You're never out of a game with Dak Prescott, and he proved it once again. Uh, with that being said, Joe Thomas is the best linebacker on the Dallas Cowboys right now. Filled in for LVE, came up with some big plays, lots of tackles for losses. Uh, listen, it's going to be a track meet all season long if you're a Cowboys fan. If they're going to play any team with any kind of a talent, they need to score at least 30 points. There's no other way to look at it. The defense is a giant hole at the moment. They, they can't get home with their front four. Um, they haven't dialed up really any other blitzing packages or anything of that nature they're going to start having to otherwise they're going to be absolutely screwed they're going to have to score 30 points a game at least and 30 wasn't enough this game van you had something to add well just that if you wanted to catch a little more insight on exactly what happened in the game and and our take on it we actually did a live reaction of the game nate and i did 
And um, we definitely had some reactions at different parts in the game, such as me <laughs> going, we're all going to die. We're never going to lose. This game is over. Turn out the lights. The party's over. And uh, uh, But we also had the reaction once the watermelon kick came, right? Oh, my gosh. This was the this was the butt fumble of uh, butt fumbles. I actually... Let's let's I have another question for the YouTubers. Worst blooper. The watermelon fumble, onside kick, or the butt fumble? Ooh, that's Worst a good call. Blooper. Yeah, please comment below. Yeah, if you if, uh, if you have an opinion on that, okay. But actually, if you're gonna throw that in, you gotta throw in the Leon Let uh, uh, turning the ball over in the snow by by trying to recover the uh, and the Super Bowl. Yeah. Leon Lett running down the Super the, Bowl. Don the Beatty. Super Bowl I don't care about because that guy made it so many plays over. in the Super Bowl. I do not care about that one. But, well, it, but it was 17. funny. It was funny, though. I gave Yeah, you it that. was. Uh, even right. the play in the snow was funny. But uh, even it, on That cost him the game. I remember that. Yeah, that cost us the game against Miami. I, I, how yeah, did you I lose did. a game against Miami in the snow? All right, all right. But, uh, but, yeah, please comment below. And also, you know, hit that subscribe. Hit that notify. We really appreciate it. So look, describe about the watermelon kick, what went right, what went long, and then what Dallas was able to do after that. Well, Dallas, here's the thing that uh, this Brian Broaddus made this point, and this is something that is not trivial, trivial in my opinion, is they kicked the ball to Dallas's side, the Dallas's sideline. Had that been kicked to Atlanta's sideline with no, with barely any crowd noise, they could have easily heard, shouted instructions to recover the fumble, recover the fumble, recover the fumble. I don't think that's a trivial issue. So they specifically. No, obviously, the Arthur Blank of the Falcons agrees with you because, as the coach has uh, immediately said in the postgame interview, he said, well, of course, the players knew. You know, uh, obviously, they made a decision to wait uh, just because of the angle of the ball. And. You know, Arthur Blank came out and he said, oh, it, obviously they didn't know exactly what to do. They looked confused. They looked indecisive. They waited too long and Dallas knew what to do. That's what happened. So there's a little disconnect there between the coach and the owner, don't you think? Well, no, it was the ghost of Kyle Shanahan. Woo! Who knows how to blow a fourth quarter league? Woo! Well, it was a great kick, um, and, you know, Zerline was fantastic with it, took it down. And then after that, uh, go ahead, Tom. I, I mean, I was going to ask the question. You mentioned the number 30 before, right? You know, Cowboys need to score over 30 points. Now, with Dak Prescott after that game, how many digits north of 30 will his yearly salary be now? Because Dak is playing for a contract. Oh, yeah. I mean, Mm. Well, yeah, that's why Jerry Jones should have egg on his face, if anybody. Oh, uh, totally. But that's okay. He'll spin it. He'll spin it. And, yeah, that that's another uh, stat there for, for Dak. He had the uh, the three touchdowns and the uh, – was it – and the 300 or 400 yards or something like that? Yeah. yeah, I actually – he was my – he was my quarterback in fantasy this week, so oh, I was happy. So that worked out. No wonder you're okay with this. Like, all right, all right. Um, so, I mean, it's a, it's a fantastic game. Then they came down, set it up, uh, took the game with no time on the clock. And then basically there was a lot of conversations that you don't normally, you know, I, I, I'm calling people that I haven't talked to for three years going like, yeah, yeah. As I recall, weren't you an Atlanta fan? Yeah, yeah, you're the guy I want to talk to. Okay, sorry, it's the third one. I got, I kept getting the wrong numbers. Okay, <laughs> and, you know, you have those kind of phone calls, right? <laughs> but, but one point I want to bring out: when all hope, there was just a glimmer of hope after that onside kick. They needed to make a play. They needed to make a play, and there was only one person that could come on. Amari Cooper was covered. Michael Gallup was covered. Dalton Schultz was nowhere to be found. But there was one man. Who could they go to? Ah, ah, C D Lamb. C D Lamb. Tom knew that one was coming. Okay, yeah, he, yeah, he, he yeah, totally yeah. knew that one was coming. All right, and uh, actually, I want to thank Atlanta. Not only did they leave us C D Lamb, they let him make one of the key plays of the game and show exactly. You know, so that we could appreciate the gift they gave us. You know, I think that's nice. Instead of waiting till later in the year for him to break out, they kind of let him break out this game. So Atlanta, I might go there on vacation this year. I'm just saying. 
you, you are very loving and giving. Yeah, the yeah. well, no, it's not the. I had almost said Philadelphia, but that's you know, the. Not the, going there. Not that. shrimp and grits the, for me, man. Shrimp and grits for me. Okay, look, that's the NFC East. We've reviewed what happened this past uh, a week. Uh, it was almost a tie for first place with the Giants and the Cowboys. Missed it by that much. Uh, and but I tell you what, it's just a whack season right now. Uh, as everybody that's a true Cowboys fan knows right now, going to the Super Bowl, baby. Uh, <laughs> but but uh, no, it's it's one game, right, Nate? Yeah, and they're going to play arguably the best team in the conference next week in the Seattle Seahawks in Seattle. So let's let's not get too excited. Yeah, without the fans there, I understand they're letting the Seahawks actually play with twelve players. So it, it's going to be interesting. Well, it's also, too, you know, Russell Wilson took out the mastermind, Bill Belichick, at Seattle, too. So they ain't, Seattle's the team everyone everyone keeps on forgetting about. Oh, man, I, I sat there and watched a certain wide receiver that kept dropping, dropping all the way into the second round until Seattle finally got him. And him and Russell Wilson worked the defensive player, excuse me, of the year, Gilmore, I mean, uh, he ended up with like, I think, 100 yards, uh, one of them of 50, uh, like three catches, something like that. But one of them is like 54-yard touchdown. Um, and he just worked him all over the field. He is a big, big man, and he is just a handful to cover. He is better than he was last year, and he was a handful last year. Yeah, and it's going to be interesting to see. They're going to take – Trayvon Diggs got beat twice this past week on deep routes by the Atlanta receivers. So, and, I still like him, though. Yeah, me too. I still like him, but he's still a rookie out there, and if they get the matchup with DK Metcalf, they're going to definitely attack him deep. All right, well, look, that is the NFC East report. We certainly appreciate everybody hanging in there. And if there's something that you want us to look at, something you want us to know, uh, be sure and drop something in the comments below. Don't forget, we're coming back this weekend uh, on Friday at 6 p.m. We're going to have both the Giants weekly report and the Cowboys weekly report that go out. And that's going to be a preview of the games coming up that weekend. It's going to be fantastic. The Cowboys weekly is with Nate Dowdy at No Remorse Sports on Twitter. You can't miss him there. He is the man. And for the New York Giants at Defense underscore com on Twitter, you can't miss him. Him. Don't miss either one of these shows. They were a lot of fun. Had some in-depth stuff. The stuff we talked about was viable for the game. It was fantastic. And so until next time, what do you do, Nate? You're going to listen like you play with intention. <laughs>